Hello everyone, welcome to our Facebook Live today. Thank you to all from near and from far for joining us and being in our audience. I see Mary from Ireland, uh, Becky from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Jackie from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Let's see, we have Joanne from New Jersey. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. If you haven't yet, please type in the comments and let us know where you're tuning in from and what the weather's like over there. Uh, I heard there was some snow in some places in the US last week, late in the season. So let us know what the weather's like, where you are. And uh, thank you so much for tuning in today. We have a great session lined up for you. A very exciting one. We'll be talking about the My Heritage Photo Tools. Uh, one of my favorite subjects because I just love the My Heritage Photo Tools. I think that they make such a difference to the way we view our family history and uh, we're able to share it with our friends and family and really uh, you know, get a different perspective of our family and how they once were. So, so excited about this topic today. Uh, and there's just so many different photo tools that we have. And of course, we're always working on the next best thing. So lots also still in the pipeline for the future. Uh, let's see, I see we see Rose from New Jersey, Jill from Ireland, uh, Beverly from Pennsylvania, Robert from Colorado. Uh, let's see, we have Yvonne from the Netherlands. So thank you everyone for tuning in today and for joining us here in the audience. Um, so today we hope to do a giveaway of a My Heritage Complete Plan. Uh, and the great thing about the Complete Plan on My Heritage is besides for everything else that it gives you, it will also give you unlimited access to all the My Heritage photo tools that we will speak about today. So uh, definitely it'll be a great opportunity to be able to test out everything that you learned today in today's session. So to enter, all that you have to do is just let us know which is your favorite photo tool on my heritage, <laughs> which one, uh, and why. <laughs> so I'll tell you that my favorite photo tool, I'm giving away my answer, <laughs> but my favorite photo tool uh, is my heritage in color. And that's because uh, I've just had so many details that pop out of pictures and just come to life when I colorize an old family photo. And I always find uh, you know, family members are able to really relate to the photos a lot, uh, a lot differently uh, and on, on a different level when the photos are colorized. So that's my favorite photo tool. Uh, now's your turn. <laughs> Let us know in the comments section, what's your favorite My Heritage photo tool and why? Uh, and if it's, you know, about a specific case where you used it on a specific photo and it really meant something to you, uh, definitely put that in the comments section and let us know. We love to hear stories, uh, you know, about using a specific tool and then showing the photo to a family member and having it make all the difference. Uh, we'd love to hear about that. Uh, and besides for the photo tools, the My Heritage Complete Plan will give you unlimited access to 17 billion historical records, uh, a number that's constantly growing as we add more historical record collections to My Heritage every single day, <laughs> uh, as well as unlimited family tree size, access to all the advanced DNA features, and much, much more. So a great plan to be able to give away to one lucky viewer today. Uh, leave us comments throughout, and we hope to give that away at the end of today's session. In addition, feel free to leave questions and comments throughout today's session. Uh, we love to hear from you and, and see what's doing. So now let me introduce our speaker today. We have with us James Tanner. Uh, he is just a pleasure to have on our Facebook Live. And he is a, uh, you know, he's been doing genealogy for over 40 years and an avid blogger of Genealogy Star. And we have so many amazing sessions recorded by him on the MyHeritage Facebook page. You can see all of them under the video section. Uh, let me bring him out here to say hello to us. Howdy. Hello, James. Here, there we go. Now we, now we can see you. <laughs> Okay, well, nice to be here and uh, nice to talk about my heritage again. 
Thank Always you so much pleasure. for joining us. Um, we're, yeah, today we're going to really get into some photography. I've tried not to be too technical, so I hope it doesn't uh, get some people confused. But uh, I think photography is kind of a challenging uh, topic to to compress down that doesn't get into some technical things. But uh, we'll try to keep it simple. Fantastic. We're really looking forward to this one. OK. Here, should I bring up your slides? Let's see if I can get them up here. One moment. I'll let you know when they're up. OK. There we go. All set. OK. I guess we'll get ready to go right now. Well, we're going to talk about comparing um, in, in sort of a, a simple way, not into real detail, but a simple way comparing to uh, photo, the photo processing tools that are on MyHeritage with what you would think of from a, a professional perfe uh, perspective. Um, I've been involved in uh, photography ever since I was uh, quite young. <laughs> Started about 10 or 11 years old being much involved and all during my life and have been uh, selling ph my photos for years. And it's so it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's an area that there's always room to learn and to grow and the technology has been changing very rapidly. The photo that you're looking at here on the on the startup slide is uh, my great grandmother and great grandfather and they, uh, the right hand side is the colored an enhanced version of the original photo. These photos were uh, printed from negatives, and I received uh, thousands of these photos. My, the grandmother that's shown in the picture was a professional photographer, and uh, so she was very much involved, and her photography collection is now uh, uh, maintained and, and kept at the University of Arizona, and they're uh, vast photography library that they have. So this is uh, this is where we're going to start, and uh, we'll move on to some of the basics. Something that you just really kind of have to understand to to appreciate what's happening when you look at the the things that my heritage does with photographs. The first question, of course, is what is resolution? Uh, that's kind of a big deal because it's used by uh, camera manufacturers and smartphone manufacturers uh, of all kinds uh, to to sell their products and they'll tell you that you've got all sorts of things and what we talk about generally is called megapixels and that's uh, how many thousands and thousands of the little sensors that are built into the new digital cameras and the uh, of course, when we're doing uh, work with genealogy and we're doing our family history, if we get photographs from our ancestors, they're not going to be digital. <laughs> they're going to be uh, paper photographs, or in my case, going back far enough into the 1800s, they were glass negatives. Uh, that would be a photograph that was taken onto a glass plate uh, using an emulsion, a light-sensitive emulsion. Uh, very difficult to use, very difficult to transport, and uh, it was amazing that these glass negatives had been uh, preserved for so many years. So the photos that I'm using today come from uh, high, primarily from those glass negatives, and you'll see uh, a lot of what we call artifacts uh, around the edges. The, the black on this particular photo, for example, is not trees. That's where the negative had degraded and separated from the from the glass base. So that's irrepar you can't repair that. There's nothing there. It's just a matter of uh, having lost that portion of the picture. And so one of the overriding reasons why we go through this whole process is for preservation. Uh, negatives of any kind, uh, this, the, up to the most current ones before uh, film com cameras became sort of on the down run from the main and digital cameras became, came in. Came in. Um, all of every kind of physical type of phot photographic media uh, from glass plates up to the, the modern uh, celluloid 
type of, uh, and further than that, the different kinds of, of strata, strata and media that they've used for photos, all of them degrade over time. And it's just a, it's just a natural, natural process. So digitizing the images is extremely important because the digital images, if they're maintained and not lost, uh, will not degrade. So they're going to be on the on the computer uh, just as they were when they were created and scanned from the original negatives. And I had to build some equipment and actually to get these negatives to uh, to be digitized because there wasn't uh, it's not something you just walk in and buy from a store. So the question here is why is there's this big deal about the resolution? Well, there's actually three main different ways of looking at, at, digit, at uh, resolution. The one that's the most common that you'll hear about is called dots per inch. And dots per inch is a printing term. And it had to do with how many little specks of, of uh, ink were used to make up a, a, photo, a, a publishable photograph. So it, the higher the resolution, the more dots per inch, the more detail you could see and the more impressive the, the printing was. When digital printing began with, with um, digital printers, uh, photocopying machines and digital printers, then there was a maximum sort of a, a, a standard set at 300 dots per inch. So there's most of what you print, if you put, if you have a, a new printer that you go down to the store and buy and set, unless it has some way of, of increasing the, the, the resolution of the, of the image, uh, it probably is going to default to around 300 dots per inch. And I'll, I'll explain why that's important as we go along here. Another way of measuring a resolution is called lines per inch. And this is exclusive to printing. It hasn't really come over to uh, uh, the digital world or to anything outside of the printing industry uh, and photography. But photographers don't necessarily think too much about lines per inch. But when you go to print something, that's what the, the first thing they're going to ask is, especially engineers will ask, well, how many lines per inch is this? And the lines per inch are actually established by a... Uh, a standard print and if you go online and look up uh, lines per inch and look for standard and a standard card you'll find uh, representations online of, of what a lines per inch card looks like uh, the last one is is purely digital and that's pixels per inch and the pixels are as I've already mentioned the little sensors that are inside the uh, the camera or the smartphone and they're basically based on the on the how many there are and so they're called how many per inch and they're thinking in terms of of square inches now when we get into uh metric sense system pixels per inch comes out 2.24 centimeters so the number of of pixels in 2.24 centimeters is roughly equivalent to uh, an inch uh, pixels per inch and one pixel, if you want to know that, uh, is 0.64583333 out to infinity um, um, micrometers, micrometers, little tiny things. Okay, so they're very, very small, and they'd be very much in, uh, invisible unless they're blown up, it's magnified greatly. So, what? You, but what you really need to know when you get to this is that the more pixels equal higher resolution and that means more detail and a larger print size so when you're talking about so many dots per inch so many pixels per inch whatever it is and you talk about in terms of, of millions of pixels like in megapixels then what you're looking at is a comparison number uh, if something is 12 megapixels like the common smartphone then that's a lower resolution. It doesn't have as much detail as something that is 20 megapixels or 50 megapixels or whatever. So that's just sort of a rough guide. Now, if it were that simple, then you would say, well, then why are some of the smartphones still on 12 megapixels? Why don't they go to, like some of them have gone to a size 
50 or more megapixels. Well, there's kind of a law of diminishing returns here. Uh, the higher the resolution does not mean that you'll be able to see any more details. And we're going to talk about that right now, because that's going to show us uh, some, kind of give you some idea of what we're talking about and why all of this is important. So what's the resolution of photographic film? So if you have a, a smartphone that has a 12 megapixel camera or a smartphone that has something higher than that, how does that compare to uh, the average photograph on Kodachrome or Ektachrome or one of the other films that are out there. Still, by the way, most of them are still being sold there. Every once in a while, we'll see in the industry, someone just uh, begins to not develop any certain kinds of films again. And the number of, of varieties of films that are available are, have certainly diminished over the, over the years as, as digital imaging has become more and more current. Okay, so here's we're back to the house. And as we get to the house, we'll see if we go zoom in on the image. And I'll go back and you can see. So you look over at the gate under the window on the front of the house there. And if you and I'm going to click in and you can see this is this is probably about as high of a magnification as you would want to go uh, looking at a, a or, or look, using a film, um, an image from film, because it's not going to get any better. And the higher resolution, you would lose more and more detail until you really couldn't even tell what the picture was. So, but resolution of the film is equal to about 85 megapixels. Well, there are cameras today that will go up to 100 megapixels, but you've got to be willing to spend lots of money thousands and thousands of US dollars in our currency to uh, to buy a camera that gets into that range. So film is still a way to get higher quality uh, and higher resolution images, uh, depending on the quality, of course, of the camera you're using. But the average smartphone has 12 megapixel sensor. So why are we kind of stuck on 12 megapixels? Well, I would I would venture to say that, um, th that there's a reason for that. And the main reason for that is some, is not as simple, but it's, it is, turns out to be pretty simple. Now, the resolution of the human eye is about 576 megapixels. But here's the, here's the deal. When we talk about the resolution of the human eye at that resolution, that means our entire field of vision. So if you have fairly normal vision. If you put your hands up to the side of your face and go out and then put your hands back and back, at some point your hands will disappear and then they'll appear. That's your field of vision. If you can do the same thing going up and if your hand disappears as you go up, as you stare straight ahead, that's how many, and that's huge. And that's why it's so big. That's why 576. But the little chips that are inside the smartphones and the cameras aren't that big. They don't take in that much rip, that much light and that much image. And almost all printing, as I've mentioned, is at 300 dots per inch, which is way, way, way down from megapixels. And the average 27-inch monitor, if you have a big computer monitor, is only about 15 megapixels. So when you start to think in terms of what you're actually seeing and what you can, can appreciate, the, your eyes, even though they have that high degree of resolution, it's at that large size. But if you concentrate on a small area, and as, even assuming your eyes are you're not nearsighted and can't focus your eyes clearly, you're basically cutting down on your field of vision and you're ability to see drops and actually 300 dots per inch is about what people can see at a, at the reasonable distance for reading or for about anything else and that's basically the reason why almost every publication book or whatever it is that you're looking at that's been reproduced and uh, was produced digitally is at 300 dots per inch uh, it can go higher, but the higher quality ones, the price goes up significantly, 
But in addition to that, your ability to see any more detail does not increase. So it's, uh, it's kind of a trade-off. And where the trade-off is, is that uh, what we talk about a 12 megapixel camera image for the average image size, it's adequate. It's just, just fine. But you can't really get into a comparison because when you start talking about all these big numbers, uh, most of the time they don't make a lot of sense. Now, one of the things that's happened with um, the technology with digital technology is that the digital technology now can enhance the photos and create higher resolution images and that the size of the sensor is somewhat arbitrary and if you have all of the like all of the programmable and even artificial intelligence type programs they can go in and create what appears to be higher resolution even when uh, the actual size of the sensor and the number of sensors hasn't changed. And that's what this is. Okay, so here as you see on the right-hand side, a 20.3 megapixel uh, Canon XX, XX70. Uh, this is a Canon camera. It's not a high-end camera, Canon camera. Canon's cameras go up to 50 plus megapixels, but uh, it's adequate. And you can look at that photo and it looks completely, it looks in very sharp, very, uh, very, seems almost perfect. Okay. And on the left hand side is a 12 megapixel photo um, from a iPhone 13 Max Pro, which is the latest iPhone camera. And if you look at those, they both look great as far as the, the visual image. We can zoom in on the images. So here's, we're gonna look them at a little bit larger and now we'll zoom in quite lot large on the left-hand one. You can see now, you can see what's called pixelation. In other words, you're looking at the, that the images created by each of the little tiny sensors that are in the camera. And if you go over to the Canon photo, you'll see the same little pixels. Uh, there's no escaping it. It doesn't matter how many pixels you start out with. If you blow it up to certain size, the pixelation is going to be the same. You're always going to be able to see those little dotty pixels because that's how digital images are created. Uh, when you do a photograph, rather than getting pixelation like this, you just get blur. You just lose the detail and you can't see any more of the detail at all. Um, the advantage of digital is that these little pixels that you're looking at can be enhanced and they can, uh, by very complex uh, it, digital processes, they can make those into even sharper images than they are today. So digital image resolution really has more to do with the size of what you want to print. So if you have a 12 megapixel image, there's going to be a limit to the physical size of a print before you begin to see the pixels. If you have a 20 megapixel, you'll be able to go larger and larger and larger. But when you do that, it doesn't necessarily mean you need to have worry about the size of the pixels. What you have to worry about is how close people are going to get to look at the photo. So if they're holding it in their hand, that's one thing. If they're walking down the street, it's another. And if you looked at these billboards out here, in um, uh, up close, you would see all the pixels. And it's just the way that your eyes work that they ignore all of the detailed pixels and create the image. So uh, part of this whole process is in fooling your eyes into seeing the image when it's made up of dots. And that's done by having it the dots so small that your eye, because of its limitations on its resolution, cannot see the difference. And that's, that's the key to this whole thing. So let's start into the process here of what's going to happen. So here we have my <clears throat> grandmother, and this is before anything. So this was a print that was made back in, um, it's going to be about 19, probably 1920 or between 1915 and 1920. And 
basically this is the res the, this technology that they had and if you are amazed at the detail and how wonderful some of these photographs appear they were great the whole process was wonderful but uh, they could be better okay so i took that photo and started in and after about an hour using um, photoshop and uh, and Lightroom, two of the programs that I have from Adobe that are are used for, for photo manipulation by most of the professionals. Um, after about an hour, I had just begun to, to uh, edit the image. It took me that long to get into it and get it so that I had it set the way that I wanted to and had the set background separated from the foreground and things like that. Now, all that process, uh, is available if you want to spend the time and the the money and the effort to learn about how to do this with uh, those programs using those kinds of tools they're there and i very very frequently use those tools to enhance my photos and so does so do almost all the other phot photographers out there so if i'd worked on it but if i worked on enhancing the, the photos every day and I purchased additional software, some other programs that are even more advanced uh, and uh, more expensive, I could cut the time down considerably. In other words, practice makes perfect. If you do it every single day, it gets better and it gets, uh, gets easier to do. I'm talking about uh, not just a few days, I'm talking about months and uh, sometimes into years of experience before you can get to the point where you're efficient, but it's still it's still a very time consuming process, which is why it's, it's an expensive process and why the programs are expensive that do it. OK, this is the same photo after about 10 seconds with my heritage repair. OK, this is the original. And this is what it did after about 10 seconds with my heritage. Now, this illustrates the technological leap that there has been in how photographs are uh, manipulated. So you just, it, it's just almost, this is the kind of thing that when I initially saw what came from my heritage and, and when my family members and the other people around me started looking at these photos, it was always, Wow, how do you do that? Oh, and it because of the time difference, the time it took to do this. It was just a matter of seconds. It's not hours of spending in cleaning up a photo. And so you may not think this is a dramatic difference. It is a dramatic difference. It, it, it really has changed the, the entire, this entire photo. Okay, so repaired and enhanced is the first level and so first of all you have your original and i'm going to put them side by side here is uh, after using the entire process of adobe lightroom and not this case and, and the tools are the tools in adobe lightroom which is a uh, extremely expensive program from some from some standpoints and photoshop are very very similar they do this exactly the same things uh, they're just set up differently and Lightroom is more directed at professional photographers and Photoshop is is directed at professional designers so there's the photographer people use Lightroom or some of the other competing programs okay but this is what my heritage had with repaired and enhanced photo and not not counting the the um, time and the and the and all of that it's it's the it's the ease at which this is accomplished with a um with my heritage that makes the tremendous difference here and it's it's interesting because as time goes on the technology that was uh, introduced to most of us in a in a very immediate level with our my heritage photographs has now become a major sub industry in the photographic industry and the larger uh, smartphone manufacturers are competing with each other in implementing 
this technology in taking photographs. So when you when you talk about is the latest um, phone that's available, smartphone that's available, does it do a better photograph than the film photographers, photographs or other cameras? The answer is because of this technology, it is what is happening is uh, what they call point and shoot cameras are almost disappearing in a sense. And film cameras are, are still struggling, but uh, it, it's, there, there's, there's niches, there's, there's groups of people that are still using it. But the impact of this technology is going to continue to the point where a professional photographer uh, and many of them are now thing, are saying, oh, well, I can get as good a quality and I can carry my smartphone with me and I can take pictures that I can sell just as quickly and just as fast as any other camera. And so there is this, and it's this what happened with me actually, is that I'm uh, thinking of taking some pictures uh, in the near future uh, on a trip. And the question is, do I haul my 40 pounds of camera equipment or do I take my smartphone? And I think we're down to the smartphone. And uh, the one important thing is this, my heritage enhancement total took le less than a minute. And that's, I, I can't even get the program open and set for, for one of the big programs in a minute. And colorized makes a tremendous difference. And colorization, there's the original, and colorization is almost impossible without special software. For someone to try to go in and do this manually would just be an overwhelming task. Now, for many, many years in photography, um, you may not be aware, but people were employed in colorizing photos. And so it's not unusual to go back and find old photos uh, of your family or of others and uh, find that they've been colorized, which means that they took the negative or the, the print and they painted on it. They'd used paint and, or inks, and they painted on the color to make the color. But the color does not come any, anywhere close to this the colorization process. So here's an original. This is a, a, a close up of, of the original photograph. That's the one that was uh, scanned from the, from the negative that this photo came from. And then, on the right hand side is the repaired and enhanced photo from my heritage. So you can see there is actual difference. It's actually physically better photograph. And so that's what's what's that's why this this technology is amazing. It's amazing because this opens this very, very advanced and very complicated technology and makes it available to everyone who who uh, subscribes to and is part of my heritage. So we have this available to us. So the tools are available and I have to remind everybody, the tools to do all this are available on Lightroom and Photoshop, but there's no comparison to the time it takes to edit the images when we get, get involved. Uh, there are automatic settings that you can create on, um, on both programs, on Photoshop and Lightroom that will run through and do this kind of thing. But you can also buy additional programs today who, who have taken advantage of the, of the technology that is happening in the smartphones and, and for things like what are being done at MyHeritage. And they sell those programs separately. And if you add on all that material and spend all that money, then you get the exact same product. And it's just, it's just incredible. Okay. so. This is the best Lightroom image I could get in a reasonable time period. After working at it and, uh, and spending some time, uh, I, I didn't want to spend any more time. In other words, we, I got to the point where I said, I've had enough and that's, that's all I'm going to do. And then here's what the original looked like. So you can see what that's happening there. So. I'm not saying that you can't do this with the other programs. It's just they're not not this. It's not all of the same thing. So now we go from here. This is the 
uh, house. This is my, actually my grandparents' house, uh, great-grandparents' house. And this is the house where my father was born. And uh, it's a it's long history in this house. And so here we have um, a couple of children out in front. And so now we've enhanced that same photo. And if you switch back and forth between the two, you can immediately see the difference in the trees, the difference in the roof, in the windows, and uh, with the children who now are almost completely visible in the, the second photo. And you might have not have noticed, but there's a couple of individuals standing clear over on the, on the left-hand side of the photo also. Okay, so now let's see what happens when you enhance and when you colorize that photo. And do you see any dramatic difference here? Well, there is a really dramatic difference as far as I'm concerned. This house now looks like it did when I was a child. This is what I remember seeing, is this house. So I think that the whole process here is uh, has an emotional content that is that is extraordinary. So now if we look at the children, then we can see even more what appears to be even more detailed because now the highlights of the hair, the colors, and uh, and the detail is even better. Now, one of the things that's happened here is that these children were moving. They weren't standing completely still. So parts of them are blurred, not because of the cameras couldn't get the resolution, but because uh, they simply moved. And that's kind of been eliminated, not entirely, but almost completely by modern uh, camera technology. The time, the speed of how fast the images can be taken is now in hundreds and thousandths of a second. And uh, most of the blurring type images have been eliminated unless you're taking pictures of something moving extraordinarily fast. Okay, so here's the black and white and here's the color. So you can see this is zoomed in on the original and this is zoomed in on the My Heritage Enhanced and Repaired. So there's, uh, you know, and, and ultimately, like I said uh, at the beginning, ultimately, if you zoom in, in on a photograph, uh, it's just going to become blurry. You're, it's not going to ever pixelate. You're never going to see the distinct little pixels because they're smaller than uh, it need. You'd need a microscope to see the, 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 the light little pieces of, mi of mineral, usually uh, silver and silver compounds that are used to create uh, a print. Okay, so here is what happens, of course, what happens if we start out with something that's really bad? The other photos that I started with were, were quite nice photos. Here, this one is, let's say uh, it's a little bit underexposed. Over, it's kind of it's kind of hard to tell what happened with this photo because it's it's simply not. Uh, it looks like it's overexposed, meaning that there's too much light, but there's still the detail there. So what happened to the photo? We, you know, it, it would it was probably uh, a matter of uh, the timing that it was given. It wasn't fully developed when it was taken into the dark room and developed. So that's what it looks like now. So here's the original on the left. And here's what I did with Adobe Lightroom, spending the money and the time on that program as a professional. And now I have the, my heritage repaired and enhanced version on the, on the right. Um, there's differences. Uh, you can get into some really technical uh, discussions about the, the, the texture on the sweater uh, the, uh, the reflections on the face, uh, the highlights on the hair, whether uh, individual hairs are visible. But this is, uh, this is an amazing uh, comparison here, the, the time and the technology that's been, in, that's been created that does this in a matter of a few seconds. And then we go from the uh, original to the Lightroom to the color.
And now you can see the, the vast advantage of having the color. So how many of you noticed uh, some of the details of the image until you came out and cover, like the little uh, toy uh, train down at the bottom on the side of the chair? And the, and the detail of the chair and the back and the fireplace in the background. Okay, so here's the caution though. We always want to keep the original photo. We don't throw them away. We don't, uh, we try to keep them as, as, as long and as we can because they're, they are artifacts. They're irreplaceable. They are originals. They are not going, and we need to do what we can do. And in my case, when I had this vast collection of my grand, great grandmother's photographs, uh, after digitizing all of the photographs, I donated them to the University of Arizona Photographic Library. And they're available now and preserved by the University of Arizona. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that sometimes need to happen. And there are places and there are people who would like to preserve. And this is what the family should be doing. But be aware that um, my heritage changes are called non-destructive. That is, the original is always pre preserved. You can always go back and get your original photo, even if you make all of these changes. And that's kind of the essence of having this kind of information uh, we want to keep as much of the information in the original photograph that is possible and not, not do things that are destructive, that, that cannot be reversed or cannot be um, uh, eliminated if we decide that we like the original better than we like any of the enhancements. Okay, so now we have a really, really badly damaged photograph on the right and uh, what happens ultimately with the color, colorized version on the left. So things like the tears, uh, where, the, where the pieces of the photograph are missing, there's nothing we can do. Once, there, once the image is gone, it's not gonna be retrieved um, unless you had a time machine and that's probably not gonna be around for a while. But things like the tears, those things can be replaced. Now, if I spent, uh, an hour or two on this photo on the on the uh, right, uh, I could repair the the photo the tear. I could repair any of the other artifacts that are there, uh, the the uh, pieces of black things and look things like hairs that look like they're there and that sort of thing. But I couldn't colorize it. I wouldn't have a colorizing level, and so despite what this might do, taking it to the color level has created a whole new, opened a whole new world. And that's not to say that, that there isn't some program out there that will do that, but why would you worry about it since you have my heritage that has provided this marvelous technology? So I would say that my heritage pushes the limits. It's, it's always pushing as far as they can to do things as dramatically different and as dramatically improvement as they possibly can find. But there's always limit to what can be done. So on this photo where there's big tears in it and the, and the pieces are missing from the photo, uh, where it's gone, <laughs> that's the limit. We can't, we can't reconstruct what was in the rest of the photo. And no matter how limited that is, what is already there is, and what's been done is totally amazing. Okay, well, thanks for watching. By the way, these the photographs at the ends of almost every one of my pre presentations uh, that I'm doing, unless there's some limitation on it, are my photographs. So you can see what kinds of things I do and what kinds of photographs I take at the, the ends of my usually at the ends of my presentations. Okay, any questions out there? We do have a few questions. First of all, I didn't know that the photographs at the end were all uh, your work, so that just makes it so much more special. <laughs> Beautiful, now I have to go back and rewatch all your past presentations, <laughs> to see all, those, all those photos that you've used. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so we do have a few questions from the audience that we've received. Uh, Randall asked, can this process be used to clear up old documents to make them readable? Yes. It does the same thing with old documents. In fact, it sometimes works better because um, if they are really hard to read, then what you can do is, is just run it through this process. You may not want to colorize it because um, sometimes it, it interferes. Sometimes this color interferes. But uh, if you just do the, the um, enhancement and repair, it sometimes will just do a marvelous job in helping them to be readable. Yeah, it, it does extend to every kind of image. It's not a list limitation. What else? Okay, next question. Let's see what we have here. Uh, we have a question from Anne Elizabeth who asked, I've been a member for a few years, but I still have a difficult time getting my photos for different sites to my files on my heritage. Um, so just would like a few hints on transferring my pictures. I guess to my heritage from other other sites or or how can she do that okay well this this kind of opens up a uh, it would it would actually be a whole presentation but uh it just from simple standpoint the product the photos have to be digital in other words they have to be of, of uh take with a camera you can do it with a digital camera and digitize a photo or you can put it on a flatbed scanner or you can put it on a, on any number of other very high-end professional scanner type things but uh, once you have the digital image whether it comes off your phone or off your camera uh, then your only thing you you're concerned about is the format and i didn't get into the technical formats but uh, most of the formats that we're using and and processing now are called jpeg images there are some kinds of images that are that are uh, more uh, preserve more information and in the, in the to say it in a simple way like tiff images t-i-f-f -F or t-i-f images uh, and a, a whole different there's all different kinds of file formats so one of the first steps is that you need to to make sure that uh, you are able to upload that file format to uh, my heritage. The ones that are most commonly used are readily available and readily uploadable. So that's not a problem. But the secondary problem is uh, the resolution. So once you've once it's been in a program, and a, a lot of times what I'll see is someone has uh, done a uh, like a thumbnail, taken a picture of the person's head, and put it into a photograph, and those are too small. They won't they won't upgrade up load into my heritage it's sometimes when they get really tiny small so one of the other considerations is uh, simply transferring them they have to transfer from whatever program or from your camera to your computer and then they can be upgrade uploaded directly to my heritage so and most of the time it's just drag and drop uh, or click and find the file and upload it so those processes are pretty straightforward. Okay, we have a question here from Susie. I have an old photo of my mother, but her eyes were green and the photo was colored and her eyes show up as very blue. Can I redo just the color of her eyes? This is a question we get, I think, <laughs> I think quite often. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a common question. And the answer is, wait they may be able to do that <laughs> right now i i it's hard to to take just a, a part of the photo uh it's it can be done all at once but uh it does take very very sophisticated to uh to get in and try to change details within a photo uh, by the way people do that constantly and you would not believe how many i would guess that and we call it photoshopped because that's become the term for it that means changing the content of a photo you can almost guarantee that if a photo is in print it's been photoshopped it's been changed from the original photo so the old one about uh, you know uh, having a photo to to prove something happened or whatever is uh, it just doesn't even go anymore because they can be changed 
Um, and as a follow-up, Susie asked, do you have a class already saved to explain the process for transferring photos and redoing the photos? I don't I don't think so, but that's a good idea for a future future face. No, I think I think you just asked for a new class. <laughs> <laughs> and we do have a whole bunch of Facebook lives about photos. So I definitely suggest uh, Susie, um, you know, definitely take a look at what we have there. Some are more basic, some, you know, go through all the processes in depth. So definitely take a look on our Facebook page under the videos section. I don't know if we have one specifically about transferring photos. Uh, but but there's lots of good um, hints and tips available there in the various Facebook Lives that we've done about photos. Um, Adriana asks, how do you recommend we repair significant cracks in old photos? Well, my heritage is the repair function on my heritage does a really good job with cracks. That's the one thing that it manages to uh, to get rid of. The problem begins when there's significant uh, physical changes to it. In other words, if if the crack is large enough to to affect the content of the photo, like it's separated or it's no longer uh, right next to each other or something, then the the, the repair will not be com not as perfect. It's it can't be because you're lo losing information that can't be reconstructed by having that blank space. It's like having the corner torn off on the photograph that I saw. So it, but uh, yeah, it's just the process is, is there. Uh, to go any further than that, um, you really would have to spend a lot of time on a, on a photo uh, editing program in the, in the range of Photoshop and some of the others. There's just no way to do that yet. It's, it'd be like, okay, I lost my photo. Can you reproduce it for me? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, that that doesn't work. Not yet. Maybe in maybe in another twenty years. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe in a long time down the road. Never say never. <laughs> uh, I'm sure we wouldn't have been able to imagine everything that we can do with photos nowadays. You know, back back. Well, I mean, who would think that I was debating whether to take my expensive camera equipment? on a trip or just substitute it with the camera I had in my pocket. You know, no one would believe that. And you can go online now and read any number of articles, just an almost unlimited number of articles from professionals who are saying, I took my, fo my phone on my last trip to do my photographs. So it's just, you know, the, the technology has just become to the point where it's almost, almost unimaginable. It's, it's just beyond comprehension. It's incredible. Quite incredible. Yeah. Um, and we'll just take one last question before we do our giveaway for today. Uh, this one is from Carol. Uh, and Carol asked, uh, once the photo is improved, where can I send it to get printed? <laughs> so any advice, uh, James, what do you do once you've, you know, once you've um, used all the MyHeritage photo tools? What well, do you, do your you have you have a lot of different types of uh, levels of, of people publishing or printing photos. And you just need to investigate because they the cost of doing that can be from maybe a, a couple of dollars for a print from your, you know, from one of the big box stores out there that do uh, that do photographic printing and our and commercial printers around the United around the world who do you know, commercial printing for for a uh, uh, for a cost to somebody who simply can run it through a scanner and put it in a or use your digital file to print it out on a color printer. So you get all different levels, and the prices go from maybe a couple of dollars for a print up to what you want to pay and what size you want to pay for. Okay, great. Uh, this is just so. Oh, yep, you're, you're... oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're muted a little bit. No, I didn't want to stop you, but you were muted. Oh, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. No, I think it just maybe there was a delay here. Uh, <laughs> um, 
But uh, thank you so much. I think this was so, you know, this was such a good base for us all just to see kind of the, the terminology in terms of professional photography and and how the My Heritage tools really just automate so much of, of what you are, as you said, what you are able to do using other programs, but really kind of on a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, each photo at a time. And um, and with My Heritage photo tools, it, it's a matter of seconds and you can just, you know, run a whole slew of photos. Yeah, through them. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. So incredible. Um, so now we have the honor of giving away a MyHeritage complete plan to one lucky viewer who will get access to all these MyHeritage photo tools. So as James explained, that includes the MyHeritage in color, um, the MyHeritage photo enhancer. Let's see what else, what else didn't we, we spoke about MyHeritage repair feature. Um, we didn't speak about deep nostalgia or deep story, but those as well. Um, incredible tools that will be um, awarded to this winner as part of the complete My Heritage plan. Uh, so we're really uh, glad to be able to give this away today to William J. Watson. And William wrote, wrote to us and he said, um, it's William from Portland, Oregon. Um, I love the co colorizing tool. It did a great job on a four generation photo from the year 1900 with my great aunt, great grandmother, great, great grandmother, and great, great, great grandmother born 200 years ago this year. Wow, William, um, first of all, congratulations on your win. And please send us a message on our Facebook page to claim your prize and we'll award that complete plan to your account uh, but in addition we'd love to see that photo so please feel free to share it with us uh, i'm sure it's such an incredible photo that you have what a treasure so thank you for sharing that story with us and thank you to everyone who left a comment in the audience with all those amazing uh you know amazing comments and and reactions to the photo tools let me let me mention one more thing Sure. When you go to the um, live vision, the, the you know the, the pictures changing and, and animation on that, that's that's science fiction. That's beyond anything <laughs> I could even imagine doing as a photographer. I just you know I take a video, but I can't do that to an old photograph. I can't do a thing. <laughs> that's just way beyond us. So it's it's just too fabulous, and it also is so emotionally impactful that it just makes people cry. So it's just, it's an interesting, another addition to a technology that already pushes the reality. <laughs> definitely. I think that, you know, just hearing the reactions, definitely the reactions that we hear to my heritage in color and the photo enhancer. Um, but then in addition, you know, um, reactions to deep nostalgia when people yeah. see their ancestors moving. Um, yeah, it, it definitely, you know, um, brings, brings the emotion to a different level. So uh, yeah, so thank you everyone for sharing your your feedback and and what you think of the MyHeritage photo tools. And James, thank you so much for a, another incredible presentation that was really enjoyed by all. Thank you again.